Hey guys, how we doing today on this fine Thursday as I record this video? So almost Friday, yay. Um, all right, so guys, we looked at the Patriot Act. We looked at the use of torture in Guantanamo Bay and in Abu Ghraib, right? That prison just outside of Baghdad. So we looked at a couple American examples of illiberalism, right? Where people don't act according to the principles of liberalism, right? Based on freedom and equality and all those things. Now what we're going to do is we're going to check out some examples of illiberalism um, in Canada, right? Because Canada, our government has done some terrible things as well. And the first example that we're going to talk about is the internment of Ukrainian and then Japanese people. Uh, and Ukrainian, uh, well, it's primarily Ukrainian, but Eastern European people happened in World War One, and it was primarily Japanese people, and that happened in World War Two. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit. So number one, one thing that I definitely want you to know about is something known as the War Measures Act, and you should have maybe heard about this a little bit last year in Social 20. Uh, last year, you would have looked at it in the context of what is known as the FLQ crisis. Anyways, uh, the War Measures Act was passed in 1914 as an act of parliament here in Canada. And what the War Measures Act does is it gives the Canadian government extraordinary power and authorities extraordinary power to arrest detain and basically suspend civil liberties during times of crisis, war, or apprehension. And with this, guys, uh, in World War I, it was believed that the people of European ancestry were a threat to Canadian security. So the Canadian government invokes the War Measures Act, and then they decide that people of Eastern European ancestry had to be registered and then many of them had to report to internment camps. Now, what's an internment camp? Well, you can see an example of one right here on the page. An internment camp is where people are forcibly detained for political or military purposes. It was believed that the loyalty of these Eastern European immigrants may have been not to Canada, but to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So let's talk about World War I history for a second here. World War I, of course, we have two different competing factions. We have the Entente Power and we have the Central Powers. Now, of course, Canada fought on the side of the Entente Powers because we were tied to the hip to Great Britain, still largely are uh, in a lot of respects. Um, and then we had the central powers and in the central powers there of course was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. People of Eastern European descent, primarily Ukrainian people, were of Eastern European, uh, or sorry, they were from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And as a result, the Canadian government believed that they might be possible spies, right? They might be engaging in espionage and they could be saboteurs and as a result the decision was made to put them in internment camps now there was 24 internment camps scattered across canada and in particular here in alberta there's two that you as a citizen of alberta have probably visited there was an internment camp in jasper national park and there was also an internment camp in banff national park as well i'm just going to scroll down here all right, so you can see what the internment camps actually look like. Sorry, I just click here. Uh, this image here, you can see, right, the uh, men who were confined in the camps of the 8,500 supposed enemy aliens, right? That's a term that I want you to know, right? An enemy alien is a person who, in this context, was seen uh, as possibly fraternizing or supporting the enemy, in this case, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, so yeah, the call went out to have people of Eastern European descent, primarily Ukrainian people, 
report to one of these 24 internment camps. Now at these internment camps, the people, the men who were in these camps were used basically as slave labor. So in Banff and Jasper National Park, because of their value to tourism uh, for the government of Canada, um, these slave uh, or virtual slaves were used to uh, chop down trees, they were used to build roads uh, and other laborious tasks. Um, and just so you're aware, just so you're aware, um, none of the individuals who were forced to submit to the government to be interned ever actually committed a crime. And when you reported for internment, all of your property and possessions were taken and then sold. And once you were freed after uh, the war was over, and in the case of World War I, the internment operations lasted until 1920, two years after the war was over, which is like, the war's done, and they held on to them for another two years. So once they're freed, they had nothing to go back to, right? They had to restart their lives over again, which is incredibly cruel. All right, let me just... Scroll to another image here, right? You can see, um, again, these interned men. Uh, and again, these operations weren't just in Alberta. Um, you should have hopefully watched in the last module a video about internment operations that occurred in Vernon, British Columbia, right? There are camps scattered from all the way from Newfoundland all the way to the coast of British Columbia. Um, and yeah, guys, again, these um, enemy aliens never actually did anything wrong. They just happen to be, I guess in this case, the wrong ethnicity in the eyes of the Canadian government. All right, let's keep moving. Okay, now what we're going to do, guys, is talk about internment operations here in Canada in World War II. So the second time the War Measures Act was used uh, happened uh, when World War II became a reality for Canada. So once Canada started participating in World War II, uh, what happened is initially they made people of Italian and German uh, ancestry register with the government, but very few of them were actually interned. It wasn't until the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, right, December, or December 7th, 1941, a day that FDR says shall forever live in infamy. Um, that next day, the Canadian government determined that people of Japanese ancestry were also a security threat to Canada. They declared them enemy aliens, history repeats itself, and the War Measures Act was invoked. Now, instead of 8,500 people being interned, what we saw during World War II was 22,000 people of Japanese ancestry were interned here in Canada, primarily in British Columbia. Now, why BC? Well, in British Columbia, there was a large Japanese population that lived along the British Columbian coastline, right? Vancouver, Vancouver Island, etc., right? Even more up north, because a lot of them were fishermen. Uh, and as a result, um, it was believed that these Japanese fishermen and their families might be, again, spies, saboteurs for the Japanese government. And in this case, they were seen as a threat to Canadian security. Now, guys, whether it's World War I or World War II, this, this particular uh, or these instances of the War Measures Act being invoked, uh, it brings into uh, account the idea of freedom versus security, right? It brings into the idea of which is more important, right? Security of a nation or freedom of its people. Now, freedom, security, we've already seen it as a topic here in Social 30, right? With the creation of the Patriot Act in the United States of America, we see this whole freedom versus security debate become an issue in America after the September 11th attacks. Now, here in Canada, right, with the de declaration and creation of the War Measure Act or War Measures Act in World War One and World War Two, um, we see the government prioritize security over freedom as well. Now, continuing with the images, um, there's some of the racism that was faced by Japanese people, right? You can see the sign there. Obviously, uh, it was a much different time uh, at that point. 
And then we have another image here. Okay, so in this image, you can see guys, a uh, Japanese family. Uh, often what happened is the police or RCMP came knocking on someone's door, right? And you were told to grab one bag and you're being relocated. And the Japanese people living uh, in coastal British Columbia were forced to move inland, right? They're forced to move inland so that they wouldn't be the threat that the Canadian government saw. Um, yeah, and often it was men and women uh, who were separated, right? The men went to one camp, the women and children went to another. Now, just like what we saw in the internment operations in World War I, their property was also taken uh, and then uh, it was never returned, right? So you were sent to these internment operations and it wasn't, uh, or once you were freed from the internment operations, you had to restart your life over again. And as a matter of fact, the Canadian government in this particular case told Japanese Canadians that they actually had to leave British Columbia, right? Because it was too close to the coast. And again, there was the possibility in the eyes of the Canadian government that they would continue to be security threats. So they moved Japanese people east of the Rocky Mountains, right? They were told no Japanese allowed west of the Rocky Mountains. They all had to be east of the Rocky Mountains. And if you know your Canadian geography, you know that as Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Quebec, Ontario, right? Or the Maritimes, but just not in British Columbia. Uh, either that or they choose to be deported. And in this case, 10,000 Japanese people actually chose to be deported at this time. So a pretty sad piece of Canadian history. I'm hoping that you watch the videos on the uh, or in the last module regarding both the internment of Japanese people and the internment of Eastern European, uh, primarily Ukrainians during World War I. Now, the Canadian government uh, has formally apologized for each of these internment operations and hopefully we've learned from our mistakes and how inhumane these people that were interned were treated. Um, they were not guilty of anything other than being born a certain ethnicity. Now, why was this illiberal? Well, to arrest, detain, uh, with basically, uh, you know, no evidence of wrongdoing, anything like that, to take away a person's civil liberties is obviously pretty darn illiberal. To forcibly confine and steal the property of people and sell it out from underneath them, that is pretty darn illiberal. And... We'll continue looking at illiberalism with the uh, third instance of the uh, War Measures Act being declared um, with the October crisis of 1970 coming up in the next module. All right. I love you guys. I hope you're liking my quarantine beards getting nice and long. Uh, and we'll talk to you later. Peace.